apply, I'll take things in the order of my opening, um, given that various points have been made by various people at various times. Um, so the order I'll take it in is, first of all, dealing with Article 23 and what I think may now be being referred to as a sort of sins of omission challenge that we bring in relation to Article 23 analysis by the judge. I'll then deal briefly uh, with the respondents' notice points on Article 23 insofar as they need to be dealt with, um, given the limited submissions we've had on those. C claims, you mean? Yes, yep. C claims, yep. absolutely. So C claims within Article 23. Um, and the sins of omission challenge in, in under one is the materiality. Absolutely, that's material validity, precisely. Sorry, I shouldn't <laughs> get you. No, it wasn't. Euphemism. Um, I was going to say that thirdly, I'll then turn to sins of very much too much commission in relation to Article 6, um, because that is the issue 4, where we say the judge has gone too far in relation to these matters. And then I'll come back to the issue 1 formal validity points, if I may, um, and, and deal with the points that in particular Mr McLean uh, made. And then there are one or two final points to be picked up in relation to one or two of the other issues and defendants, but I think that overall those are relatively limited towards That's the end. helpful, thank you. So then I will, if I may, start with the material validity issues again, um, and where we say there are key legal errors. And, and, and as has rightly been put, our contention is that there is a missing element in relation to the analysis of Article 23 in the judgment. I'll focus on four points, none of which will come as a surprise to the court, which are the importance of a strict <coughs> construction in relation to Article 23. I'm going to pick up in particular Mr. Tregear's suggestion that there's somehow a two-stage analysis that one carries out, and it's only strict at the first stage. Um, I will also touch on issues of consensus and the importance of consensus, and that potentially being a rather different approach in European law from domestic law. Um, in doing that, I'll look at CDC, which is obviously important, and I'll also touch on the nature of the disputes at issue, since that's part of the key consideration here. And it's been suggested that somehow all of the disputes are interrelated and therefore fall within the particular legal relationship, however it's to be characterised, that arises from the opening of the bank accounts where the exclusive jurisdiction arises. <coughs> now, uh, we provided, obviously, the rubric in relation to how the steps are to be taken, and we recognise uh, that the precise order in which they're taken is less important than the manner in which they're engaged with. Um, starting then with the suggestion by Mr Tregear that the strict approach that we saw being articulated in the early case law and the importance of the strictness of law uh, uh, interpretation, we say that that is not simply a question of taking a strict approach as to whether there is an agreement. And then somehow, as Mr. Tregear suggests, that there is then a more liberal approach to be adopted when one's looking at the substance of that agreement from the, purpose, from the point of view of European law. And I think in many ways that might be most easily illustrated by going to CDC directly. Um, I know I've taken you to these paragraphs, but I, in the light of what's been said, I think it's worth revisiting them. So it's Authorities Bundle 5, tab 48, if we may. I'm, obviously, the court has been taken to various passages in this, but where I want to pick it up is at page... 1657. Um, if one turns back a page, you'll see this is all under the third question, which pertains to Article 23. I took you to this in opening. And I pick it up at um, 66. It says, if the applicant did prove to be bound by the clauses at issue, it'd be necessary to ascertain whether they did in fact derogate from the referring court's jurisdiction as far as the case in the main proceedings is concerned. So you can see immediately there, you're not then just talking about whether or not there's an agreement, but the substance of the agreement. In that regard, it is for the national court to interpret the clause conferring jurisdiction invoked before it. 
in order to determine which disputes fall within its scope, and I'll come back to Paul Dufferin in a minute, the site is, a jurisdiction clause can concern only disputes which have arisen or which may arise in connection with a particular legal relationship, which limits the scope of an agreement conferring jurisdiction solely to disputes which arise from the legal relationship in connection with which the agreement was entered into. So we're here seeing that paraphrasing of the terms of Article 23, but an emphasis on the limitations there. The purpose of that requirement is to avoid a party being taken by surprise by the assignment of jurisdiction to a given forum as regards all disputes which may arise out of its relationship with the other party to the contract and stem from a relationship other than that in connection with which the agreement conferring jurisdiction was made. So again, citation of Paul Dufferin. In the light of that purpose, <coughs> the referring court must in particular regard a clause which abstractly refers to all disputes arising from contractual relationships as not extending to a dispute relating to tortious liability that one party allegedly incurred as a result of the other's participation in an unlawful cartel. Given that the undertaking which suffered the loss could not reasonably foresee such litigation at the time that it agreed to the jurisdiction clause and that the undertaking had no knowledge of the unlawful cartel at the time, such litigation cannot be regarded as stemming from a contractual relationship. Such a clause would not, therefore, have validly derogated from the referring court's jurisdiction. And it's saying that in relation to that particular type of dispute. So it is citing Powell Dufferin. It is carrying out the analysis. It is referring to consensus, which I'll come back to. But it is adopting what I say is the strict construction requirement, not only in relation to the existence of an agreement, because there's no dispute here about the existence of an agreement. It is all here focused on whether or not you're complying with the substantive requirements of Article 23. So with respect, Mr. Tregear's attempt to sideline strict construction by a two-stage approach is just wrong in European law. And that illustrates the position. If we may, with that in mind, then just go back to Paul Dufferin. I, again, I, I know that the, the court's seen it, but um, authority... It doesn't seem to have been an argument run below, not that that's a reason why we shouldn't consider it necessarily. What, the two-stage? Yeah. No, no, it's I don't, not. I don't see it anywhere, and I, I don't I'm, see any authority. No, no, it's never been run before so far as... But I'm not taking an no, issue... No, or, I, or, I know, or, I'm just no. making sure... Yeah, not as I far as I know. I'm, I'm always slightly cautious, because I wasn't below, and, and those behind me will, will tell me whether or not, not I, it was, I'm so. wrong. But... Um, but no, I've not seen it anywhere. Um, but uh, the reinterpretation of the argument put forward by Mr. Tregear I deal with nonetheless, because it, it, it fits with the broad point that has been raised, which is one should adopt a relatively broad approach to this, uh, whether it's the idea of the dispute, the degree of connection, or the nature of particular relationship. And it's a particular species um, that is the one that's put before you today orally. So if we could then just go to Paul Dufferin Authorities Bundle 4 at tab 40. And um, we're, we're dealing here at page 1364. It's the second part of the second question. It's just, just to re-emphasize why there is this ordinance of strict construction, both in relation to the existence of the agreement, but more particularly the substantive scope of the agreement under European law. Second part of the second question. Purpose of Article 17, obviously as it then was, of the Brussels Convention. Jurisdiction is conferred for the purpose of settling disputes which have arisen or may arise in connection with a particular legal relationship. Right, we're on 1364. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, 1364 at paragraph 30. I apologise. That's my fault. Thank you. <coughs> I was just picking it up at the start of this section. Um, and we do say that particular is more than just an identifying term. If you didn't need, you don't need it. You could just say a legal relationship. The draftsman has included particular relationship there, which
which obviously fits with this whole thrust of strict construction. Is there any um, authority on the meaning of the word particular? Yeah, not as far as I know, not in European law. Anybody else? Uh, the requirement is intended to limit the scope of an agreement conferring jurisdiction solely to disputes. So we've seen this language, it's being reiterated. In that regard, a clause conferring jurisdiction contained in the company's statute satisfies the requirement if it relates to disputes which have arisen or which may arise in connection with a relationship. And then the question for the National Court is whether that has the effect. And then you get to the answer in paragraph 34. But all of that is being put forward and justifying the approach that is being articulated later in CDC and elsewhere because it's a derogation in these circumstances. And we can also see this, if we may, just bouncing around the bundle slightly, go to Authorities Bundle 5, Tab 52. And I'm going to go to the Advocate General's opinion about, in respect of which the <coughs> claims have great enthusiasm, but a different paragraph from that which they've referred to. Paragraph 30 on page 1752. court has had occasion to emphasise in that it allows derogation from the rules on jurisdiction laid down in regulation, uh, the, the Brussels regulation, the conditions, both procedural and substantive, to which Article 23 of that regulation makes the validity of jurisdiction clauses subject, must be interpreted strictly. And interesting there, they actually draw the analogy with the Estesis Salotti uh, case, which of course we've seen uh, giving general guidance in relation to Article 23. Conversely, provided that the procedural and substantive conditions laid down in that regulation are fulfilled, the jurisdiction agreement must be capable of being applied. In fact, the choice of court in a jurisdiction clause may be assessed only in the light of consideration connected with the requirements laid down in Article 23. So, here, in the most recent case that's been emphasized, again, strict construction, proce procedural and substantive. And it's because it's a derogation. And of course, because it's a derogation, both from the basic jurisdictional approach in Article 2 of the regulation and the convention of domicile, and from the special jurisdictions, for instance, under Article 6, it can create fragmentation. And so it is entirely possible that because of reliance on exclusive jurisdiction clauses, you can get situations where you will get fragmentation of multi-party litigation, and you will therefore run the risk of irreconcilable judgments. But that just is a product of the operation of Article 23, but to some extent also militates in favour of the stricter construction approach. Because, of course, many of the pleas we heard this morning about the absurdity of our approach in relation to Article 6 is all built on this idea that the Article 23 analysis is to be adopted broadly and extends to particular parts of particular claims with particular individuals. And that that derogation is actually the source of the problem in relation to many of these difficulties and so-called absurdities. We say they're not absurdities. You are going to get anomalies in circumstances where you have these derogations. We recognize that. And I'll come on to deal with why, nonetheless, Article 6 approach, it, it provides for a strict approach. But nonetheless, you have to accept that there may be situations where one looks at just the particular individual or just the claims in relation to a particular individual and says, well, how has that come about? But the answer is, in these circumstances, it is often driven by the derogation arrangements that have been entered into in relation to jurisdiction clauses. 
So we say strict and limited approach to all aspects, so that is in relation to the identification of the particular relationship. It is also in relation to the uh, nature of what has been referred to as the connection in relation to these matters. But we are very cautious about the use of the term connection here. Because, of course, any form of connection just isn't good enough. You can't just talk about a connection between the dispute that's being raised and the particular legal relationship, which includes the jurisdiction clause. Indeed, as we saw in Powell Dufferin, actually the connection language is about the connection between the jurisdiction clause and the <coughs> uh, particular legal relationship. It's the, the uh, particular legal relationship in, rela in connection with the which the jurisdiction clause is instantiated, that that language is actually used. But the important thing is, however we're taking this language, we have got to be cautious about avoiding looking at too tenuous a connection. Because, of course, if you look at something like CDC, <coughs> what you had was plainly a connection between the cartelling arrangements and the contract for sale of goods because the claims in those cases were all about overcharges in relation to the sale of goods under those contracts. No doubt about it. So there's obviously a connection. If there weren't a connection, all of these damages claims that are proliferating in relation to competition cases wouldn't exist. They are predicated on there being a sufficient connection you can rely on the cartel as affecting the charges that you then incur through your contractual arrangements with suppliers. No doubt about it. But what CDC tells us is that is not the sort of connection that is sufficient. And that's when we l use the language of originating and arising from, which we're not making up, we're drawing from the case law. And we're asking ourselves, is it really from the relationship, the particular relationship in respect of which one has the jurisdiction clause, that these disputes are originating? Is it from that? And obviously, in relation to the cartel case, we say there is a close analogy with the present case because what we have in the situation of CDC is our counterparty in the sales contract entering into arrangements with third parties which are unlawful. And in those circumstances, it is that relationship from which the relevant disputes arise. And we say in our case, the relevant disputes arise from the arrangements between the banks and Mr. Al-Rajan and Mr. Nasrallah and his other associates. And that is the key consideration. Indeed, what was actually helpful when Mr. Marshall was taking you through on behalf <coughs> of Mr. Amusgar, the pleadings in relation to the Pictay nasrallah agreement the simple submission to be made is, yeah, Pictay Nasrallah agreement. OK, that is our characterization and our pleadings. Mr. Marshall was praying it in aid to illustrate the position in relation to Mr. Amuzgar. But that is the relationship that really gives rise to the concerns about secret commissions in relation to Pictay. It is that relationship, it's that structure of agreement. And that is very much analogous to the situation in relation to the cartel. And for, it's for that reason we say, if you're looking at particular legal relationships and asking yourself whether or not the disputes we are pursuing in these proceedings originate from those legal relationships, those particular legal relationships which were instantiated through the opening of bank accounts, we say that is not correct. And Mr. Tregear, of course, says, ah, yes, but you opened the bank accounts because Mr. Al-Rajan had entered into some sort of arrangements with the bank by which if he pushed investments in your direction through those accounts, or some of them, because of course in relation to say Mirabeau, you've only got one account, <coughs> and actually in relation to the investments, it's only 11 of the 28 investments that went through or were actually held in that account. He says, yes, 
but you wouldn't have opened the accounts if it hadn't been for the arrangements that existed between Mr. Al Rajan and the bank that had been put in place. Well, that may or may not be right as part of the scheme put forward by, uh, orchestrated by Mr. Al Rajan and his associates, but that doesn't make the dispute fall within the scope of the legal relationship under which the bank account was opened. Indeed, we know from the uncontested for these purposes facts that actually the structure of front companies and arrangements were being constructed by Mr. Al Rajan with the various individuals who are represented in these proceedings and the banks before the accounts were opened. Can we, can we test it in, in this way? Um, let's suppose um, you're a Kuwaiti entity and that you had an exclusive jurisdiction clause um, which you were, were seeking to, to rely upon and your manager um, and um, employees of your counterparty were involved in a corrupt arrangement to your disadvantage. Um, surely you would be saying, no, you've got a, you know, I'm, I'm entitled to see you in Kuwait. Um, you've, this, this, this all arose out of my, my banking with you. I'll just try, I mean, can you distinguish how you could, how you could be done down in, in, in those circumstances. And if the boot was on the other foot that you were seeking to uphold. An arrangement yeah. where our bank managers in Kuwait, subject to... No, you're, 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 you're Mr. Al-Rajan. Yes. Um, <coughs> was involved in dealings with um, employees of, of the banks. Yes. Uh, but you'd had a, um, an exclusive jurisdiction clause in your favour because you happen to have those out before you do banking. Uh, with Swiss banks, and um, and they said no, 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 you've got to sue us in Switzerland or wherever we're domiciled. Um, and I'm just trying to en envisage a situation in which you could be defeated. Um, I mean, they would say no, no, our skullduggery was all Swiss skullduggery, and it had nothing to do with your banking arrangements. I mean, just, I'm wondering how that Well, I, how that I, I suppose I have to take it in two stages. First of all, I wouldn't want to presume to make any submissions about the interpretation of exclusive jurisdiction clauses in QAT law. No, no, well, Kuwait I'm, using, I, I I'm completely... using here as country yeah. A and country yeah. B. Just... Quite understood. Um, and I think the answer is, well, we can't be hypocrites about that. We would have to recognise that in relation to the submissions that we're making, if in those circumstances we had put in place such clauses, that covered the sorts of disputes we're talking about, then the situation would be different. But if they were in the sorts of terms and yeah. in relation to simple bank account... So those circumstances, you, you, you'd be able to say, right, well, we think we've been cheated massively. Um, and also, um, we're being made to sue where... Um, despite our EJCs, we're being made to sue where the, where, where the cheats live. That's, I mean, that would have to be the boot on the other foot of your submission. I've got to accept that. I can't do anything else. But the, the fact that that's the way the law works and the way that one has to interpret these clauses, yes. I think I, it, I, there, there isn't another way of looking at this. No, it's, just, it's, it's simply that, that sometimes, um, speaking to myself, one's thinking can, also, it, it can always be coloured yes. by, by a perception of who the alleged wrongdoer is. Of course. I, I, um, and here one has, in a sense, wrongdoers in both entities, um, allegedly. Um, and, and so it's useful, it seems to me, to test it the other way around yeah. um, by imagining that you were seeking to uphold your EJC on the basis of what they'd done to your account. Yeah. Well, if it, if it was precisely done to the account, then that might be slightly different. It, it would obviously depend on exactly uh, what, what was at issue. But if what you're actually asking is, if you had the same set of allegations, yes. then yes, I, I must accept that. Yes, I, 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 there, isn't a, there isn't a choice, but we say that is what flows from the proper interpretation of Article 23, as long as we're within Lugano territory. Yes. We, we can't pick and choose the way in which the interpretation works. So, no, I, I, I completely accept that source of the goose in these circumstances is the right approach, but that is the way that law works. It, um, it is even-handed in the way that it can create problems for one way, I suppose, of looking at it. Um, <clears throat> so, as I say, the 
submissions that were being made in, in relation to uh, the Picte Nasrallah agreement are rather illustrative, he said, <coughs> we say, of, of the position. Um, uh, Mr. Tregear referred to various paragraphs saying, well, you needed to get money in before you could get money out. As I say, that is not identifying the essence of the dispute at all, the, the relationship in respect of which the dispute arises, um, and doesn't take into account actually the history of what we're talking about here at all. Um, we say the whole relationship was built between Mr. Al Rajan and his associates and the bank, banks, I'm sorry, well before the accounts were, were open. That was the relevant legal relationship, and that's <coughs> further illustrated. I mean, Mirabeau does capture this rather well because the idea that secret commissions in relation to the 17 investments that didn't go through the account and weren't, <coughs> weren't held in the account are somehow subject to the terms in the account when actually that whole scheme was set up previously illustrates how the dispute is not arising from the particular relationship, however it is characterised, that exists in relation uh, to the account itself. Um, there were occasional attempts by both Mr. Tregear and Mr. McLean to suggest that actually there were much more sophisticated arrangements. Um, Mr. McLean was very careful quite properly, not to suggest that Mirabeau had engaged in any management services or any advisory services. He said that some recommendations had been made. Uh, that was quite proper of him. There are three emails where, over the course of a long period, three recommendations have been evidenced. That doesn't change anything here. The fact that people recommend potential investments to themselves outside uh, the management or advisory roles, which he's specifically decrying, um, they, they take matters no further forward. He tried to dress it up as financial services. Well, we know that financial services can co cover a multitude of sins, um, but it can also co cover a multitude of uh, activities which may range from uh, very limited bank account <coughs> arrangements to much, much more sophisticated investment and management arrangements. Um, but putting that label on it didn't change the essence of the relationship. Um, Mr. Tregear uh, sought to um, uh, refer to, uh, I'm so sorry, I think it was Mr. Tregear, I apologise to Mr. McLean, talking about the <laughs> role of uh, Mirabeau in relation to the three recommendations. Um, but the, although my identity of the advocate was flawed, the point remains. Um, <clears throat> no offence taken. <laughs> Um, so it's in these circumstances that we do emphasize again that the limitations uh, that are imposed on the interpretation of uh, jurisdiction clauses in relation to Article 23 are predicated on notions of consensus, which we've seen repeatedly referred to in the case law, and the importance of being able to have informed Agreement in relation to the nature and scope. This is your the... second point under point one. Uh, yes, I'm. I am dealing with the four points essentially together because I've already talked about the nature of disputes. It's because yes. the key authorities um, pick up. But yes, I've talked about strict construction. I've referred to CDC. I've talked about the nature of disputes, and I'm just picking up now also the points on consensus. But the points on consensus—they're not separate from strict construction. They're part of the reason why a strict construction approach is appropriate because effectively what is being said in Article 23 jurisprudence is it's only when you have informally agreed to the particular types of uh, a, a dispute being covered by the jurisdiction clause that Article 23 as a derogation should apply. Now of course the Advocate General in Apple Sales was saying well you don't have to break every possible type of dispute. We entirely accept that. We're not demurring from what Advocate General Ball said in the slightest. But one does need to be a little bit cautious about taking that too far. He's recognising you don't have to write everything out, but he's not suggesting you move away from a strict consensus, a, a strict construction approach. He's not trying to qualify the need for proper consensus in relation to these issues. Um, and of course, the court then goes on. It doesn't diverge from the thrust of Advocate General Ball's approach. But it does, in the tradition, repeat effectively the key passages 
of paragraphs 67 through to 70 of CDC mm -hmm. reaching <coughs> judgments in relation to these matters. Yep, yep, the Advocate General talks uh, in quite strong terms about the primacy afforded to autonomy yes. of the parties. And also at paragraph 34 uses um, a, an, a different word for connection. He uses the word link. Yes. <coughs> which is as wide as could be, isn't it? Well, it... Uh, that is as wide as could be. And frankly, it's clear that, that if one reads Link as we might do as, in, as encompassing all, all matters, obviously that would not be consistent with the actual outcome in relation to CDC, whether by the Advocate General or by the court. Because of course, if we take Link with its ordinary meaning, then of course you would say, well, there's obviously a link between the cartel and the claims that are being made in relation to the cartel. One only has to articulate the proposition to see it. So you're absolutely right, milady. He does use that language. But I think the point I'm making is that although these terms get used, one's got to be very cautious about not seeing them in their broadest sense, because obviously that is not the outcome of this case. And as I say, that's not the outcome from the Advocate General himself. Um, and yes, party autonomy is, is referred to. But party autonomy has two aspects, essentially, in European law. Yes, it means you can enter into EJCs under Article 23, and those will provide you with uh, jurisdiction. But it also means that it's informed autonomy, and it goes to the consensus issue in these circumstances. And so when we read autonomy, we shouldn't simply be thinking immediately of some sort of Fiona Trust presumption in relation to the way in which commer the, the, the English commercial law has thought about these sorts of issues, because that would be to transpose the wrong predicate the analysis of the language. Um, so as I say, consensus fits with autonomy. Consensus remains important, and it's informed consensus. And we say here, the sort of arrangements that we're talking about uh, that, uh, that are the subject of the disputes are at least as unforeseeable as the cartel arrangements between major international chemical companies that were the subject of the findings in CDC. I mean, one of the ironies about CDC, of course, is that the companies that were actually parties to the cartel were some of the best repeat customers of the European courts over the last 30 years, having been involved in numerous uh, anti-competitive cartels amongst themselves <coughs> in relation to bulk chemicals. Um, that is not a factor that matters in relation to Foreseeability or proximity, however one wants to put it, is to be considered strictly here. And we say that those are the thresholds that really the judge did not grapple with when he came to deal with the law and then applied the law in relation to section uh, article 23. Um, <clears throat> instead, what we saw was the attempt to dilute those requirements, adopt a broader approach to legal relationships, adopt a broader approach to the notion, notion of originate or connection, and actually just ignore, really, the issues, the need for informed consensus. Yes, Ms Merrick very helpfully uh, directed me to a paragraph 90 of the Advocate General's opinion in Apple, where the Advocate General refers to the language of originate, a lady. I think perhaps just supporting the points I'd already made in relation to. Unless I can assist further in relation to Article uh, 23, um, I'm going to move very briefly to Issue 3. Yes. <clears throat> so, in relation to issue three, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how the case is quite being put against us at the moment. Uh, Mr. McLean, and I, I'm confident this time I am referring to Mr. McLean, has seemed to put the point as one of Swiss law. Um, now, if he's putting it as a point of Swiss law, we're into the territory of the sprint room analysis, because he hasn't put forward any good reason why the judge's analysis of the Swiss law, as a matter of fact, <coughs> I mean, the findings on Swiss law are findings of fact, yes. not evaluative assessments. 
Yes. So it would have to be the application of the laws you found it to be. Yes. To the facts of this case, yeah. to that extent evaluative. Yeah. But uh, issue three is a question of um, scope as a matter of Swiss slash Luxembourg law, isn't it? I think it probably is. Although there's obviously the prior question mm -hmm. that that would stand in the way of issue three, that you'd have to show that as a matter of European law, that the relevancy claims fell within the scope of the uh, of Article Twenty Three as well, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. And that just isn't dealt with. So but issue three is framed as a question of domestic law. Yes, it is. But, but you say um, you have to get over Article Twenty Three, and then you have to get over. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's law. Yeah. that's so, not contentious. I don't think that's contentious, but we just don't Must have. Right. Yeah. So, but we don't have any submissions on why under. We, well, there's no good basis on why under European law it should be included, and then we say in relation to uh, Swiss law and the evaluation of facts, we just we are miles away from crossing the thresholds in relation to the sprint room analysis or the sprint room test. I'm sorry. Um, in relation to domestic law. So in those circumstances, it seems to me that the issue three matters don't really get off the ground. Um, uh, Mr. Tregear did take some slightly different points in relation to uh, Mirabeau, which I just do need to pick up. Um, if, if we could go to the judgment of paragraph 354. <laughs> Wait on. He said, well, look, the knowledge allegations against Mirabeau are based in part on knowledge gained from involvement in the Mirabeau scheme, but also from other matters, his participation in the Mann scheme. And he said, oh, well, there's a flaw here, because the knowledge of participation in the Mann scheme was derived from knowledge in relation to the Mirabeau scheme. Um, but with respect to Mr. Tregear, that isn't the way that the case is pleaded. Um, it is only one element, knowledge of the Mirabeau scheme, in relation to these issues of knowledge. I, I leave to one side the further question that in relation to Article 23, a pleading in relation to knowledge is not going to be sufficient as an issue one way or another in order to, to change whether or not particular disputes should be treated as sufficiently originating from the particular legal relationship in any event, because the fact that you're pleading an ingredient of knowledge in relation to a dispute doesn't uh, make the case in and of itself. But, but beyond that, I would just refer you, if I may, I, we can turn it up, but in core volume three at tab 31 in our pleadings, and this is just the unamended version, paragraphs 114 to 112, you can see... Oh, one, one. 114. <laughs> 114 to 121. I'm so sorry. I can't read my own notes. That would have been a long read. Uh, 114 uh, to 112. So it's at page 630. It may be just worth turning it up. I'm not going to take it through at all. But <clears throat> You'll see that in relation to ingredients of knowledge. So this is, if you, one turns back a page to 628, that's two pages to 628, I'm so sorry. You'll see it's the, the heading above paragraph 111 is assistance in relation to other unlawful schemes, which is obviously C category. And then you'll see how that plea is structured under 111. And then you'll see over the page, knowledge begins at 113, picking it up. You see 114, Mirabeau also knew that the other sums referred to in paragraphs 108 to 111, B to G, which are the other scheme monies. So this is the non-Mirabeau scheme monies. So it's in relation to six other schemes. But the only independent thing there is the man scheme. Otherwise, it's all to do with the Mirabeau scheme, isn't it? Uh, Knowledge of the bank accounts, <coughs> the purpose for which the bank accounts set up, the use to which the Mirabeau scheme is, is, is put, can then the man scheme 
whatever comes from the man scheme. Those are the three things. I'm, I'm so sorry. That if I misunderstood. I thought you were quarrelling with um, the characterisation at 354, that knowledge came either from Mirabeau or from the man scheme. Uh, you were saying that there were, was a wider basis. Well, there is a wider basis here, but the judge is saying, well, it comes either from Mirabeau, yes. but mm -hmm. also from other places, in particular the man scheme. Yeah. And what Mr. Tregear was saying, actually, all the knowledge for the man scheme comes, comes in turn from Mirabeau. But, and what I'm saying for you is, isn't that right? Because look, the, the purpose for which the bank accounts are set up is connected to the Mirabeau. It's the Mirabeau accounts, and then the Mirabeau scheme, and then on top of that, the only other thing you've got is the man scheme. Well, no, you've got six other schemes here in relation to these. So 11... Um, 8, 108 to 111 B to G are to do with a whole range of schemes uh, that were put in place. So not just the man scheme, it's all of the schemes that are being dealt with there. I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question, m'lady. So no, it's not just the man scheme that's being dealt with here. And so what's being said is that actually Mirabeau knew the knowledge of Mirabeau in relation to these other schemes came from a range of different sources, including the man scheme, but autonomously the man scheme and then from other schemes and other relationships, and that's what's then being particularised. And therefore, Mr Tregear's point that there's a sort of circularity in the judge's analysis is just not borne out by the way the case is pleaded. So on this occasion, I'm simply supporting the judge and actually saying there's more there to see. Sorry, did, does that fully yes, answer your ladyship's question? You. And just so I'm not confused, um, so from when, he, when he says a parity and also from other matters, yes. viz participation, Yeah. That is by way of example. Yes, that's how we read it, yes, absolutely. And therefore, I'm just taking you to where man and or others are dealt with, just so, so that you have it for your notes and references. And I should also say that Mr. Trugier just referred you to 354, but of course, actually, 354 refers back to earlier paragraphs in the judgment where there's further consideration of these <coughs> matters. So... What, 3.322.1? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so part of what we would say is not only is the criticism leveled at that particular paragraph um, one that just doesn't get home in terms of the sprint room type test, uh, furthermore, it is, um, it's not taking into account the other bits of the pleading that are cross-referred to, which just reinforces the conclusion. Well, also 355. Yes. And, and indeed 356. Yes, quite so, my lady. So you'll see there that 354, when I was referring to it cross-referring, it's not just to pleadings, it's back up it earlier in the judgment in relation to PICTA matters. That was actually what I was referring to as well, my lady. Sorry, say that again. So at 354, it says, on the specific topic of knowledge, the general point in 3231 apl above applies. And so all I'm, the only point I'm making here is that this paragraph doesn't just stand alone. There are references back up to the analysis in relation to PICTE, the 3231. Yes. So it's 353. Yeah. It's the whole bit. Yeah, it's the whole bit. Yeah. And we say, as soon as you start looking at it in that context, you know we're close to the relevant test being met. That's all I'm saying, because that was the paragraph that Mr. Trudeau re relied upon. And we haven't heard any good account of why it is that we should somehow suggest that the judge got it wrong, even on his broad approach to Article 23, to say that the C claims arose from the relationship in respect of which the ex exclusive jurisdiction clauses arose. So that was all I was going to deal with in relation to issue three and those respond the respondent notice issues in relation to category C. But I recognise I've gone through those relatively quickly, so if the court has any particular issues or questions. I'm grateful. With that, I'm going to move on to Article 6, if I may. Um, so I'm, without wanting to be accused of a chronic lack of imagination, I'm going to go back to where I started with Article 6 um, in relation to uh, <coughs> the original wording. So that's the authorities bundle 5 at tab 53, if I may. Now, given the constraints of opening, I didn't spend 
spend long going through the whole <coughs> convention, but I think the court has it well in mind that the convention starting 1769 is the relevant page number. Um, starts with the general provisions after the scope in Article 1. Um, and, of course, Article 2 general provision is the state of domicile being the place where you have the right to be sued. And then, of course, we have then provisions running through, in particular, Articles 5 and 6, which make special jurisdiction provisions in relation to it. Now, one thing that's important to bear in mind is that those special jurisdiction provisions are effectively giving plaintiffs particular rights to sue in particular places. I think that that may be slightly lost when we get into these broader discussions about a balancing exercise and so on. But what is actually happening is that you're being conferred a right to sue which is an exception to or a, a special jurisdiction aside from the jurisdiction in Article 2. And if we go to Article 6 in its original wording, it's saying a part, person domiciled in a contracting state may also be sued, so that's also apart from their state of domicile in particular, where they're one of a number of defendants in the courts for the place where any one of them is domiciled. Now, I know we've read this numerous times, but it is worth bearing in mind, what was being done there was essentially putting in place a provision that meant that Article 2 didn't result inevitably in multi-party cases, international cases, in the substantial risk of irreconcilable judgments. Because if only Article 2 applied, then of course, if you've got defendants all over the place, you're going to inevitably have to set, sue them in relation to their places of domicile. And so what Article 6 1 is doing is saying we want to avoid the effect of the basic provision inevitably giving rise to a multitude of irreconcilable judgments if we leave it like that. That's what's going on here and that's how the essential concerns are articulated in the Gennard Report and so on came to pass and were articulated. So it's Article 6 1 itself that is intended to avoid irreconcilable judgments. And the reason I take you to this version, of course it doesn't have the qualification in, but it is still doing the same fundamental job. If you think of the instance of CDC, a cartel all across Europe where you've got chemical companies in myriad states, you'd be bringing exactly the same claims in relation to each of them. If 6.1 didn't exist, you would have to bring those claims in relation to each of the states of domicile. I leave aside the other provisions for, for the moment, like 5 and 23, but that's what 6.1 is doing. But then the concern arose that if you read that provision on its face, which is there to obviate, or not to obviate, but to reduce the risk of irreconcilable judgments, you don't have any apparent connecting factor, so it can get played in litigation. In other words, you can just stick a number of names on a claim form, and on the face of it, you can drag them to whichever jurisdiction <coughs> you fancy. And what the court in Calfellis is saying is, if you don't have any connection, then fundamentally, Article 2 is being undermined. And it's at that point it says, hang on a second, we just can't have that. We need some sort of minimal minimum standard of connection between the claims that are being brought in a particular jurisdiction because otherwise you can just undermine Article 2 by this means. And what method of connection did they identify? It is the one that fits with the original purpose of Article 2. They said you've got to show that the connection between the claims is such that there is a benefit in having them heard together to avoid the risk of irreconcilable judgments. 
and I use the term benefit. I know the term expedient is used in the language, but I pick it because expedient is not suggesting that you're opening up some broader test here. All that was happening in Calfellis was we built a structure in the legislation that we <coughs> gained. We must have a connection. What connection is it going to be? It's going to be are the claims that are being put forward in a jurisdiction, the anchor and the target, as they've been referred to, are they connected in some material way? What is the material way? It is the ri risk of irreconcilable judgments. And that it's is not just connection in some material way. It's so closely connected. Uh, yes, absolutely. So, I mean, there must be some um, heft behind that concept. Yes, there is heft behind it. And in a way, that's what the RIM, the, the Research in Motion Vista case is saying. It's not merely a mechanical exercise. There is an assessment on that, on that connectedness issue. There is an assessment that's required. And we don't demur from that. I think in answer to questions from my lady, Lady Justice Carr, there were points put about how connected does it have to be and what is the level of irre irreconcilability. And that is an assessment that is not merely mechanical. We entirely accept that. And so we don't have any issue with uh, research in motion and VISTA, even though one needs to be slightly cautious, because that is actually an Article 28 case. And Article 28 is about discretionary matters, so there is more flexibility. Um, but nonetheless, the key point here is that the whole structure was being built in order to ensure that the basic provision could be gained. Don't worry, we just wait a minute. Yes. I'm so sorry. I, Don't worry. I, have, I feel for anyone that is fishing in their bag trying to find the phone that's gone off <laughs> accidentally. Um, and, and actually, this can be illustrated to some extent if we just go to the Painer case to which Mr. Adkin took the call. Authorities Bundle 5 at tab 46. Um, it's at page 1570. And you'll recall he just took you to one paragraph, paragraph 77 of this judgment. And he said, as regards its purpose, the rule of jurisdiction Which is six, paragraph are we in I'm now? 77. I'm just repeating what Mr. Atkin read. And he read 77. But it's extremely important to actually read context here. Because what is being tested in Pena in this section under the first question is whether Article 6.1 must be interpreted as precluding its application if actions brought against several defendants for substantially identical copyright infringements are brought on national legal grounds, which vary. So you've got different legal bases. And then the rule is set out. And then it's stated that it's a special rule. Um, I'll come back to Freeport and Anderson in just a moment. And then 75, indeed, as Recital 11 in the preamble states, the rules and jurisdiction must be highly predictable and founded on the principle that jurisdiction is generally based on the defendant's domicile and jurisdiction must always be available on this ground save in few well-defined situations in which the subject matter of the litigation or the autonomy of the parties warrants a different linking factor. Now I just stress this, the highly predictable is extremely important in all of this. Now, your Lordship touched on the issues of complexity in relation to this judgment. What the respondents are putting forward and what the judge did in this case is a massive manufacturing of complexity in relation to the operation of Article 6. And it alone is a compelling reason of principle why that is not the correct approach. Because, of course, as Mr Pillow was very keen to uh, emphasise in relation to Monsieur Argon, when you carry out the analysis of all things under Article 6, you're not just thinking about the defendants, you're not just thinking about extant proceedings, you should be thinking about potential proceedings in relation to related claimants, in relation to a whole range of other places. And we say that sort of test was no part of what Article 6 was concerned with. But just going back to 
So 75 saying important predictability. Just remind us, is this the Advocate General of the Court? I'm sorry, this is the uh, CJU. I'm fairly confident it's a. It's it, the court. Yeah, it's the full court because it's a because it says first question. But I'm just interested in the fact that it um, refers to a rather rounder um, version of the purpose of Article Six, um, facilitating sound administration of justice, minimising possibility of concurrent proceedings, um, with reference, no doubt, to the recitals. Yes. Um, uh, as it came out, the um, the article itself refers only to the um, minimise the, the avoidance of irreconcilable outcomes. Yes. But um, unschooled, I would have thought that there are plenty of good administration of justice issues in the penumbra of that. Um, I, that I don't doubt. Um, to do with um, the avoidance of ridiculous cost expenditures yes. um, in two jurisdictions um, and um, generally having functioning systems of justice yes, and, and so forth. So uh, I, I, I've slightly felt when we've been taken to Article 6 um, with repeated reference for perfectly understandable reasons to irreconcilable judgments that quite a narrow focus when there might be many other matters that would come, in, come, come under expediency. Um, of course, one can't spread it too widely, but I just am interested to see in paragraph 77 that it's a slightly more liberal. Well, uh, of course, but our, I, we, our point is that expediency is not a freestanding exercise. No, I understand say. it's not freestanding, but it's linked in the article itself to irreconcilable judgments. Well, it's linked to irreconcilable. <coughs> what it's saying is that it is expedient to hear the claims together to avoid irreconcilable judgments. I'll come back to the language in just a moment, yes. if I may. Um, but what I just wanted to deal with here is you start with seven, to, uh, I'm just reading through, and then it's not apparent from the wording of 6.1 that the conditions laid down for the application of that provision include a requirement that the actions be brought against different defendants should have identical legal basis. As regards its purpose, the rule in 6.1 first meets in accordance with recitals 12 and 15 of the preamble to the regulation, so this is Brussels regulation the wish to facilitate the sound administration of justice to minimise the possibility of concurrent proceedings and thus avoid irreconcilable outcomes if the cases are decided separately. So yes, it is to do with irreconcilable outcomes because of administration of justice if those cases are decided separately. But then secondly, that rule cannot be applied so as to allow an applicant to make a claim against a number of defendants with the sole object of ousting the jurisdiction of the courts of the state where one of those defendants is domiciled. So the point is that first, they're talking about the essential role of 6-1, and then secondly, they're talking about the qualification, the connection qualification. So one can read the first paragraphs here, 75, 76, and 77, as applying equally to the original version of the Lugano Convention and the original version of the Brussels Regulation. In other words, what 6.1 essentially is trying to do is avoid an excessive effect of Article 2 itself. And so when Mr. Atkins read that paragraph, he read it by reference to interpreting the connection qualification that's introduced later. And we say that's not right because that is what's then talked about secondly at paragraph 78. And one can, it, with that, perhaps I can just go back to the language itself, which is in tab 5 of paragraph 54. <coughs> so this is now the amended language. Article 2 has stayed the same. That Article 6 is changed in the light of the Calfellis judgment. Personal domicile in the state bound by this convention may also be sued where he's one of a number of defendants in the courts of the place where only one of them is domiciled. So that's where we were up until Calfellis. Provided the claims, and that's those claims, are so closely connected that it is expedient to hear and determine them together 
to avoid the risk of irreconcilable judgments resulting from separate proceedings. <clears throat> and we say the claims here are the target and anchor, or the anchor and target. What you're asking yourself is, when you're presented with that as an application, so two claims being brought before you, what do you consider? You do consider the counterfactual of the target claim being heard elsewhere. And that's the only counterfactual analysis that is required. And the term expedient in those circumstances <coughs> is merely governing the benefit of being able to hear those claims so as to avoid the risk of irreconcilable ju judgments. It is not importing a broader exercise. <coughs> And as I say, we've explained how we say that the exercise should be done. You look at the anchor and target. You consider if the target were to be held, considered separately, would there be a claim was considered separately? Would there be a risk of irreconcilable judgments? That is all that is required in relation to it. And if I could just go to Freeport at tab 44 in this bundle. So if you had 10 defendants, the target in state A and the anchor in state B and eight defendants in state B, A or C, you ignore those eight defendants completely? Uh, well, let, let me just test that for a moment. You've got an anchor... And in, a target, in and, different... Yes. Yeah. So you've got an anchor domiciled in state. Can I go for yes, a state A yes, for, for the anchor? Yeah. Then I've got a target who's domiciled in state B. Yeah, but question is should they be joined be in state A but yes. you've also got defendants in another state or in state B well it, it, it depends what the defendants state. are in well, those that are linked they're, they're, they're obviously linked proceedings otherwise I wouldn't ask the question of course so the, the question then is no you don't need to consider the other six can you you may not need to but can you are you you're no. saying you yeah, cannot you're no you do not you're allowed. not allowed right. so I think we've, we've somewhat Gone, gone into a repetition of previous arguments yeah. rather than a response, and I think we have your, yeah. uh, your point. But how are we doing on the um, our progress of the reply? Uh, I've got five more minutes, so... All right. Thank you. Um, so, as I say, the place where one can see that the approach set out most easily is perhaps in the Freeport case, which is at tab 44, uh, page 1502, paragraph 41, And I think that most neatly captures the approach. Is there a connection between the different claims brought before it? That is to say, and to be fair to Mr. Atkins, he doesn't pursue, I think, the point about case file. So we say that is clearly the right approach. Otherwise, you are freighting the term expediency with far too much. It generates simplicity. It generates clarity. It generates certainty. And it is actually dealing fundamentally with irreconcilable judgments because it is the qualification to Article 2 consequences. Um, now, I just finally finish on the Alpha Laval case that was promoted from Mr. Atkins' footnotes to the high point of his oral submissions. Um, now, with respect to Lord Justice Longmore, um, it, it, I'll just turn it up at paragraph, at tab 11 in Authorities Bundle 1. He doesn't follow the approach that uh, Mr. Justice Briggs then was followed below, which was a much more orthodox approach to Article 6. That is undoubtedly true. One sees it at page 238, picking it up at paragraph 238. He talks at paragraph 34 about the need to carry out a discretionary analysis. Now, with respect, that is the wrong approach to Article 6. Yes, the connectedness assessment requires consideration, but it is not overall a discretionary so which analysis. paragraph? 34? 34, yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm in the wrong tab. I mean, 34 at 2... At 12. Yeah, paragraph 
like a tab 12 2 by 2 I'm most grateful. Now, <clears throat> one of the problems with this judgment is there's no citation of any of the key authorities such as Calfellis. There's no citation. There is citation of Painer, but there's very little else. In particular, there's no citation of Reich Montage, which I'll come back to. The judge effectively decides for himself that he will carry out a discretionary exercise. He then says, he concludes in 36, well, since the claims against the anchor defenders are dormant here, in those circumstances, I won't risk any irreconcilable judgment if I allow the case to be dealt with in Poland. And we say, well, actually, in those circumstances, one can see that you don't have any risk there at all. Obviously, that is vastly different from the situation we're talking about. But quite fundamentally, of course, in Reich Montage and then later in CDC, what we saw was that the fact that a case was inadmissible or a case was settled doesn't make any difference to the strictness of the approach in relation to Article 6.1. And as I said in opening, those cases illustrate just how strict the analysis is in 6.1. You take a snapshot, you analyse whether or not there's irreconcilability, a risk of irreconcilability between anchor and target, and you don't get into speculations about the development of cases, even when it is obvious that a case, the anchor case, has in fact gone away. So we say, not apparently argued, uh, Reich not cited, Calfellis not cited, not consistent with CDC, definitely a case that should have remained at best as a footnote without any disrespect at all to Lord Justice Longmore, who was clearly picking up uh, a particular position at the end. So we say that there is a clear approach to Article 6. It is a strict approach. Yes, there will be certain circumstances where certain anomalies will arise, but otherwise you are left with a, an all the circumstances enormous analysis that is being required, and also you have this collateral effect on Article 23. Article 23 suddenly has a potentially huge gravitational pull in Article 6, when of course the regulation and the convention didn't confer on Article 23 any sort of collateral pull beyond the scope of the precise, restrictively construed effect of Article so what, what do you mean about this? Article 23 becomes terribly important? Yes. Right. Well, as you see in this case, with the court's judgment, because critical yeah. to its assessment under Article 6 is the it fact... It shows everything along behind it. Yeah. It's the gravitational pull point. You say that the um, anomalies, as you choose to describe them, um, are, are the price of... Um, having a workable certain system. Yes, and you're going to get anomalies whichever way you go. And that's the final thing I want to just touch on in relation to the um, balancing exercise points, just to finish off, that are set out in our skeleton, paragraphs 60 through to 64, and it picks up a number of the points that were made by the defendants right at the end. That they talk about the sense of having these claims, particularly the C claims dealt with in Switzerland, it is important to bear in mind, Mr. Arajan, his associates, and all of the investment entities that were paying the secret commissions will be heard in London. By allowing Article 6 to have the force it does, what you're doing is essentially removing a key piece of the evidential jigsaw in London. Because in London, you have the person that's instigated from, this. From, from Swiss proceedings. You're taking the you, you, by the Article 23 scheme and the operation of Article 6, yes. you're taking all of the banks and indeed the money laundering out of the UK yes. in relation to them, even in relation to schemes such as the Man scheme, where you're going to have Mr. Arajan, his associates, the Man defendants, all being heard in London in relation to whether or not secret commissions were paid and how they were transmitted and laundered through to the recipients. In other words, the submissions perfectly properly made by my learned friends are not capturing what will be lost in the jigsaw in London 
in relation to these various issues. Now, we've set out our position in relation to the assessment of Article 6, but I make the point more broadly that the impact of the judge's interpretation of Article 6 is having those very significant damaging effects on the accumulation of related cases in London because of the analysis that has been undertaken here. In, in assessing these matters, does it somewhat depend, assuming that there were actual proceedings and actual trial and actual evidence upon which order they're heard in? That there will be, yes. yes. I mean, because presumably if um, somebody goes into witness box in Geneva and the London proceedings are later, yes. then the London proceedings knows what was said and vice versa. Yeah. So there's, a, there's a bound to be an element of happenstance in any fragmentation. There will be some happenstance in any fragmentation. One has to accept that. But here we have a situation where the primary defendant is here and in relation. Yes. And of course, some, some, sometimes, presumably, the case settles in one jurisdiction but not in the other. So. That's, of course, true as well. Yes, I mean, these, these things, these are the sorts of vicissitudes that essentially you are seeing in CDC saying yes. don't, don't make any difference um, and simplifying things. Two minutes on formal validity. Mr. McLean didn't deal with HOSIG. Um, it is a need for communication. It is different from the sorts of requirements uh, that are seen in uh, domestic law. Um, the Court of Appeal decisions, as effective as recognised by the judge, are clearly inconsistent with HOSIG. We say in those circumstances the result is far from uncommercial. It is just a different standard that is being applied in European law. It is consistent with those strict interpretation uh, provisions and cases like profit investment do not change that in the slightest. The judges attempt to distinguish Hosig in those circumstances uh, on the basis that somehow a preliminary reference was obiter was clearly wrong. And in those circumstances, the communication requirements do require not merely the possibility of asking for general business terms. If that were the case, all of these cases would potentially be decided differently. They actually had to be proffered and made available before you signed on the contract in relation to them. Unless I can assist the court further, those are my submissions. I'm grateful for the indulgence of a few minutes. Thank you very much indeed. Mr. Very well. Um, well, we'll consider all of these matters and um, give you our decision in writing in due course on the usual terms. Be so good as to um, um, make any uh, necessary typographical corrections and so forth, and also submit a draft order reflecting our decision. If there are any matters that you can't agree, um, then of course we'll deal with those in writing and the judgments will be handed down uh, almost certainly electronically in due course without the need to trouble you. Um, further. Um, on behalf of the court, can I thank you for the efforts that have been made to um, uh, achieve the hearing this week. It's been, um, I'm, I'm sure, more on your side than ours, somewhat trying in the circumstances, but we do appreciate the efforts that have been made, um, not only by the advocates, but by those who support them. Um, and um, when it comes, we wish you all a good holiday. And to all of you, thank you very much. Thank you.